do up on this edition of Out of Left Field, a local bodybuilder's quest to help his neighbors in Schuylkill County. Plus, we pick up the growing story of pickup soccer in the Hazleton area, and we'll learn about all the hard work the girls lacrosse team is putting in on and off the field to keep the program going at the Hazleton area high school. Out of Left Field is brought to you in part by Coordinated Health Hazleton Campus. Better together. Welcome back for another few innings in Left Field. I'm Ken Karen. Before we start, I want to thank you for watching. Leading off is a story of a local bodybuilder who is trying to inspire others. He's reaching out to those battling drug addiction because he knows all too well what they're going through. Truthfully, I didn't really understand what the Skook was. It was kind of just a nickname for our county. Uh, the more that I started to look into it, I, I would just say that it, it represents us as being just this hardworking, rigid uh, collection of towns uh, down here at the lower end of the Anthracite region. But also could be, compared, comparatively, the nickname for some of the people within the county. We are a bunch of Skooks. Absolutely, there's definitely a sense of pride from being around here. Um, we, we've, we're known for a lot of different things, but I think uh, one of the things that we were known for is just having real strong communities, just a real strong bond, you know, being the type of communities that we have and the, and the type of working environment coming, you know, being a major uh, part of the coal region and just that whole work ethic. So it's kind of like that mixture of just kind of rough edge, but really powerful, like strong families and kind of like really strong communities. So. Travis Snyder has found inner peace, but he's fighting an external war. He's already fought for his life, and now he's fighting for others who are battling addiction in Schuylkill County. He wants to put those in need on his massive shoulders. He lifts hard and then speaks softly and thoughtfully deep inside Schuylkill County at Pap's Gym. It goes beyond just picking things up and putting things down. Yeah. <laughs> it truly is a, a, a very, for me, it's a spiritual thing, you know, with Having usually I have headphones when I'm doing stuff, you know, that combination of uh, you know positive thinking and pushing our body to limits, music, and then just that the sensation you get after you know pushing yourself hard and, and getting that feeling, that rush. It's definitely uh, it goes beyond just like I said coming in here and picking up heavy things. It's for me personally, I don't really I don't put a single label on on myself as a bodybuilder. I'm just a guy who loves being healthy. I'm just a guy who loves fitness. I just happen to do bodybuilding competitions. Snyder has always been competitive. He played sports growing up and was part of the varsity football team at Tri-Valley High School. He says his competitive nature, mixed with a yearning to fit in, led to partying in high school. He drank, smoked marijuana, and tried heroin for the first time at 16 years old. I do remember getting a taste of opiates at a very young age because I had my wisdom teeth taken out. And you know, thinking back on that, like you wouldn't really, you kind of like question like, could that be the start of it? But to me, I, I didn't really think about it, but like at the time I got a taste of what it felt like. And really not being educated as to what that could lead to, you know, it just felt good. You know, and I think that's what we want as human beings. We want to have comfort, we want to feel good. And, and you know, having that extra thing that, like something that external that I could take in that made me feel good, it was almost like a band-aid. It, it was like, I think in my mind it came like a band-aid. Well, you know, I could just take that and feel good. But for me, like, I always stayed active, even my addiction. Things got worse after high school graduation. He says he started injecting heroin around the age of 23 and describes that time as a whole new level of darkness. Then around Christmas in 2011, at maybe the darkest point in his life, a spark flew. Mind you, before that I had been in a lot of trouble, a lot of a lot of different things that I was I really never held myself accountable for and I was never really truly held accountable for um, but it wasn't until December 22nd 2011 was when I was arrested you know I was I was, I was arrested for selling drugs uh, a friend actually snitched on me and um, but I, I'm thankful for that today because that's 
really part, part of the many, many reasons of the events that happened as to why I was arrested and put in jail and ultimately how that helped save my life. About the first 16 to 30 days in jail was rough, you know, going through withdrawal from an opiate addiction. You know, it's a very painful, psychotic kind of state. You don't sleep, you don't eat. Um, as I started to come to and get sort of a consciousness and I was able to feel again, I started to reflect on my life. And um, during that reflection, I realized that all the things that I was doing leading up until that moment were pretty much all wrong. And, and to, to go back into that way of thinking, into that negative thinking where, where I was blaming everybody for all my problems, I finally looked inward and you know, I held myself accountable. Um, so while I was in there, I didn't have much. You're in jail. What do you have? You know, you're in a cell. You're very limited to what you have. Two of the biggest things that I had was I had my physical health and I had the ability to express gratitude and think about the things that I do have even being in jail. So I brought that loving energy of gratitude into my life and then I brought working out. I'm talking like endless workouts, push-ups, dips, pull-ups, anything you can think of. You get real inventive when you're in jail and just went hard. It was like my coping mechanism. I wanted to take my life back. I really wanted to take it back and while in jail, that was one way that I could start taking my life back. I could start to take control and do something positive with my life. So the gratitude, filling myself up with the, the gratitude of, you know, having a family that loves me, having my health, standing on two feet, being able to draw, see out of both eyes, I mean, you name it. There's a, a grocery list of things we can be grateful for. Mix that loving energy with working out, positive energy. I started to fill myself up with all good things. And essentially that's what helped me, uh, you know, start going on that positive path. That path led to a local pastor telling him about some bodybuilding competitions he was hosting. I had that motivation to just want to go after life, you know, being in recovery and just wanting to, I had this new outlook. I'm like, I'm just going to start doing things. Like I left the fear. I just, I decided, you know, in order to continue growing, I need to get uncomfortable a bit. And so a friend told me about it and we just started working out. We decided we're going to do the competition. And uh, yeah, and then that would have been March, in March 2013 or April 2013. I did the first Mr. Anthracite and got first place for the men's physique. While he was in recovery, Snyder realized strength training wasn't all he had a knack for. In rehab in Harrisburg, he says he noticed he had the gift of connecting with people. Back in Schuylkill County, he's looking to connect with whoever wants help. I never take the standpoints in telling people what to do because I simply don't know all the answers. So that really is part of my fitness lifestyle and a part of my recovery. It all kind of rolled into one, like this big ball of inspiration of uh, being somebody that's healthy and fit and also has a story to back it up. And so that, I knew that that was a powerful thing to be able to inspire. So Snyder started The Skook Recovers. It's about a group of us. It's about everybody involved. It's about our communities. You know, it's about creating just a, a positive social consciousness. And, you know, what, what it's becoming is that we're almost becoming that inspiration. You know, we have a lot of people that reach out to us. And currently what we do is we're kind of like a conduit. We, we, if they ask if they want to know where to get help numbers, we kind of give them the numbers. You know, really what it is is just to get people from Schuylkill County that are in recovery to come out and, and kind of be that inspiration. Like in athletics, when we grow up, say you're a basketball player, we want, when you're young, you want to be Michael Jordan. You know, as an adult, and you're starting a new life for yourself, and you want to get in recovery, who are we drawing inspiration from? You know, if we're not drawing it from our peers, where are we finding that inspiration to want to, to, to learn or see what kind of moves they use? Or, you know, Jordan had his tricks and, and all the things that he did. It's the same thing with recovery. Like, we all have our own unique ways of recovering. And so that's kind of what it is. It's like we're the inspiration for other people to show them that there is a better way of life through recovery. There's so much to Travis's story that we couldn't fit it all into that segment. For example, he goes by the nickname Featherhawk, and if you want to find out why, check out SSP TV on Facebook for some bonus content. Also, Snyder has an athletic clothing line called Cut Up Fitwear. You can view what he has to offer and learn even more about his story at thefeatherhawk.com. Up next on Out of Left Field, find out how a Facebook group for local pickup soccer players helped kick off a tournament raising money for a special project in the city of Hazleton. Out of Left Field is brought to you in part by Coordinated Health Hazleton Campus. Better together.
Thanks for coming back to Left Field, the place where great local sports stories come from, like this one. This tale of local pickup soccer has a lot of layers, so let's start peeling away so we can get to the first ever Pine Street Powerball Soccer Tournament that's helping a major art project in Hazleton. El Hermosa Juego, the beautiful game. It brings people together all over the world, and that includes the Hazleton area. I hear Spanish and English a lot. Are there people yeah. who just speak Spanish, just speak English? Is there a mix? There, there's a mix, but there's also people that just speak Spanish and just speak English, but we kind of all get along. I mean, people translate for other people, and we, we, we make it through. <laughs> what are some key words that people, I hear man on, I hear, you know, draw, I mean, are there certain key phrases that translate? Yeah, pretty much, you know, if you're asking someone to center the ball, it sounds pretty similar. We, we have those words that have their similarities, and. Pretty much you throw your hand up and say I'm open. <laughs> Someone's gonna give you the ball. <laughs> There's a universal language on the pitch. John Carija was in the United States national team pool when he was 16 years old, so he can speak the language fluently. He's one of the many talented players playing pickup games around the Hazleton area. Have you met some cool people doing that like Rohan? Oh, unbelievable. Everybody's great. It goes over there. Everybody like doesn't even know each other, but it feels like you're all friends once you connect on the field. Off the field, communication is also important to keep the local soccer community going and growing. Well, I didn't really start doing the pickup games. They were just kind of a thing, and I was, you know, one of the people that would get invited to them. So I figured, you know, there's all these people and everybody's texting each other. It's kind of hard to get, you know, about 20 people together to play a game of soccer. So I figured, why not just make a Facebook group, you know, send out an invite and then whoever wants to come, go ahead and show up. And uh, people started finding out about it and then just more and more people started coming together. And I guess that's just how it formed and now people check quite often, you know, if we're playing, if they want to play in the winter time, you know, as long as there's about 14 people or 10 or 14 people willing to play, you know, we'll play a small sided game. Pretty much everyone's welcome, you know, you don't have to be perfect to be here. We're just kind of playing pickup soccer. That's a good thing about it. Anyone can show up and have a good time. Yeah, I work today. I do a lot of sitting down at work. So uh, anytime I get to get out and move, I, I try to as much as possible. I'm not, I can't really, I'm not one of those people that can run on a treadmill, but I do run while I'm playing sports. So. That's pretty much why I come out here. <laughs> Rohan Catino played soccer for the Hazleton Area High School and at Penn State Hazleton, so he's been connected to the local soccer community for a while now. I feel like soccer kind of grew a little more in the area um, as the population started getting, you know, uh, more, uh, you know, differentiated, like people from New York and other places were coming and then the U.S. team was doing so great like everybody was following the World Cup and I think now it's actually at a pretty good place where there's a lot of people playing. There's just not actually enough places to play. The Pine Street Playground is one place to play in Hazleton and when Coutinho started planning a local tournament that's where he set his sights. I was kind of thinking of doing it myself just as like you know like an unregulated thing just me and a couple of friends because I do know a lot of people that play soccer in the area. And uh, usually like the tournaments around here are either really far or they're really expensive. So they'll be like upwards of $500 for a team to join and stuff like that. And you know, not everybody has the opportunity to just travel just to play soccer. So I figured, you know, why not I get something together since, you know, I had some free time on my hands. So I was like, yeah, sure. And then I saw that Jocelyn, she, she always posts things about like community events. So I was like, hey, I'm not sure what you do, but uh, if you'd like, you know, I was thinking about doing a soccer tournament and if you want to, you know, spread the word, go for it. And she was just based, she just took the idea and ran with it and then it became this whole thing. Coutinho and Jocelyn Sturenchok, the executive director of Hazleton Power, went to high school together. They lost touch for a few years, but they reconnected and put together the Pine Street Powerball Soccer Tournament. I don't know much about sports. I don't know anything about soccer. I'm learning. It's a lot of fun to watch. Um, I just want to help our community. I want to see things grow. And of course the arts are something that are close to my heart, but also giving kids a place to go and something to do. And you know, we always say there's nothing to do in Hazleton. We have to go somewhere else in Hazleton, but we've got this, you know, a six week tournament now that's happening and people from all over the area coming to, you know, small little Pine Street to, to play games and, and they're all really enjoying it. Some of the money raised from the tournament will help out the downtown mural project in the city. So the beautiful game will help put up some beautiful artwork in a city working to revitalize its downtown area. Art is great, but it's the people that make a community and there's a 
mix of them coming together to play in the Pine Street Powerball Soccer Tournament. They're playing for the love of the game and the love of their city. The general consensus really is that everybody's just happy that we're doing it. And they're just, this is so great. Thank you for putting this together. We're so happy to have, you know, a place to go and something to do and people paying attention to it. I just thought it was great. You know, I never saw Hazleton like this. You know what I mean? So many random people get together and have fun with each other. You know what I mean? And of course it's for charity, it's great. You know, it's definitely awesome. Next on Out of Left Field, time travel and girls lacrosse. Stay tuned. Out of Left Field is brought to you in part by Coordinated Health Hazleton Campus. Better together. Batter up. It's the bottom of the ninth here on Out of Left Field. Starting a new sports program from scratch can be painful. There's a learning curve, and that usually means a lot of losses along the way. Some may say the first few years are the worst, but that's not how the Hazelton area girls lacrosse team feels. In fact, one of them is about to tell you the early history of the new Lady Cougar program is really the best of times. Let's assume for this story that time travel is possible. No, we're not going back to the 1980s to show off our smartphones. We're going to 2021. That's the year flying cars become legal and the Hazelton area girls lacrosse team wins their first championship. We're there to give the champs a video to play in their virtual reality headsets. This video will make them appreciate the players that came before them and just how far the program has come since the first season and the first game. Right about now, the team's MVP is pushing play and win Witnessing a video recorded in 2016, the team's second season of existence. Let's go back. I said I didn't want to spend a ton of time on it. But year one, it was your first year, I think, getting into this. You did it, you said, because you had daughters who, one daughter who wanted to continue playing. What was last year like for you? Last year, um, honestly, was brutal for the weather's sake. We could not get out onto a field uh, before our first game, so the girls all approached the first game not ever seeing a lacrosse field before. Uh, we had practiced in a small gym down at Butler Township, and it, the place was great to work with and great to work in, but it just didn't give them the full layout of, of the field. So when they got there, it was like, all right, uh, we have to run this whole thing. It, yeah, you have to run the whole thing. And lacrosse is a running sport. I mean, you do not sit still. The girls are constantly moving. And this was the first time for a lot of girls. It wasn't like, okay, they've had past experience in this. That was their first time playing lacrosse, a lot of them, right? Correct. Um, we had two girls on the team who had played with Malaxa, the Mountaintop Rec League. Um, and those were the only two girls that had any kind of experience playing lacrosse. Take me to that first game. What was that even like? Well, we're there and it was a cold, windy day and none of us had ever even set foot on the field. And we're all like, all right, we're gonna go out there and just try to have fun with it. You know, it's a learning experience. And the refs and the other coaches and the players, they were all helpful to us. And that's one thing that's really stood out is how the other teams who have more experience, they're friendly, they're, more, they're willing to say, hey, you know, you should be standing over here. They don't kind of take advantage of us. They're really encouraging. So in the lead as a whole, it, we really see that. Okay, let's spend the rest of our time in 2016, where girls lacrosse is a pay-to-play club sport at the Hazleton Area High School. To become a full varsity sport and capture that 2021 championship, they will have to prove they can sustain their numbers and that their skills are improving. But we proved the numbers. I have, um, I have over two-thirds of the girls returning from last year, and we are carrying the same amount of girls on the team this year as last year. The problem becomes we only have uniforms right now for 30 girls. So when I reach the 30, 30 girl maximum limit, so to speak, I had to start turning girls away at that particular point in time because I had no uniform for them. And what we did is we bought uniforms on a closeout deal so that we didn't have to spend that much money the first couple years out, hopefully that the school district will pick that up at some point in the future. So the numbers are there and the skills are coming along. First year we, we were basically concentrating on throwing the ball, catching the ball, and trying to keep the ball in the stick. Uh, second year now we've, we've taught the girls how to move around the, the half circle and the eight meter arc in front of the goal and to be able to pass the ball around, to communicate, to be able to get take their time, be patient, get the ball, 
into the goal and then how to talk to each other to get the ball back up. But they're learning the actual basics of the game. They're learning the rules and they're learning how to maneuver the ball this year. And, and they're doing a fantastic job of it. First game last year, or first game this year, how big of a difference was there? Did you guys see a big skill improvement? There was a huge difference. Last year, there was a very big score differential. But this year, honestly, the score at halftime compared to what it was last year, there was a complete different turnaround of like, especially our attitudes. We we went in the first game, we're like, oh, we're so like nervous. Yeah. This game, we knew what to expect. So we were able to um, like go in with a different mindset and know that, oh, we can do what we've been practicing all along. So from last year to this year, what are some areas you think you guys really improved? Um, passing patterns, I think like once you get like three passes, we could score it out. Last year, like we couldn't even pass, so we improved a lot on that. So things are moving in a positive direction, and one day it seems girls lacrosse will be a school-funded varsity sport. Until then, the girls, their parents, and their coaches have to work hard and fundraise. While this is added work, it gives the girls an added feeling of ownership of the program. Yeah, we really have to like make sure we're respectful and keep everything in perfect condition so we don't waste the money that we've raised and put into everything. So you want to make sure that everything's in the good condition. As the girls forge this road together, they do suffer some lopsided losses, but their captains help them keep everything in perspective. We just can't get in over our heads and we just try to have fun out of the whole thing. I mean, we're new, so we know that it's okay if we lose. We're not in it to win it. In the year 2021, head coach Beth Ann Hudock's daughter Riley will be a senior. Maybe she'll prove our prediction right and help the Lady Cougars lift their first trophy. If that happens, Riley won't need a video to remind her where the program came from because she was there in the beginning, answering any questions her mother had about the sport. She is a very fast learner because last year we started this program and she did not know anything about lacrosse and I kind of had to teach her. <laughs> I say, were you helping maybe, not to say on the side, but were you, how much were you helping? Um, I was helping a lot actually because she didn't know anything and I pretty much knew everything because I was playing for four years at that time. So. <laughs> like in practice or games or when she would come home, would she be asking you questions? Yeah. She asked me how they did and what she, we think she thinks we could improve on and I kind of told her what we can improve on and how we can do that. Maybe one day Riley will be a head coach, but right now she's witnessing something amazing. Beginnings are always special, and maybe that's because without time travel, you can never go back. What is it about this team? Everybody says that they've been on other teams, and this team is by far the closest, the best. Do you agree with that? And what is it about these girls? I think it's because we're a second-year team. It, it's still important to play, but like it's not as strict as other sports would be, so we can have like, more leniency to like play and have fun and stuff. I think after a while it's going to become more strict once we get better and better as a team. So enjoy this period. Right? Yeah. Lady Cougars stick together! Yeah! If you have any experience playing lacrosse, please reach out to the girls lacrosse program at the Hazelton Area High School. They're always looking for some help. You can do that by emailing the email up on your screen. That's going to do it for another chapter of Out of Left Field. If you have anything to say about the show or if you have any ideas for segments, please email me at ken at ssptv.com. It's been fun, friends. We'll see you next time. Take it easy.